to session E5, Unique Approaches to Risk Communication 2. I'd like to thank our session sponsor, IBM, for supporting this session today and the ASFPM conference. Our first presenter is Justin Kozak, who's a researcher and policy analyst at the Center for Planning Excellence. And he has a great presentation with probably my favorite title, What Are You Going to Do? An educational game about watershed management. And we're gonna go ahead and proceed through in just a moment to the presentation. But before that, if you have any questions during the session that you'd like the presenter to ask, please put them in the Q&A tab. There's a place you can put them anonymously or with your name. And at the end of the session, we'll go through and do Q&A and ask them as many as possible within our time limits. All right, and here is the first presentation. Hello everyone. My name is Justin Kozak. I'm a project manager at the Center for Planning Excellence. I'm excited to share some of our work with you and I uh, want to thank the ASFPM for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today I'm sharing a tool we created, a uh, game, with funding support from the Foundation for Louisiana. Um, we found that this game, this tool, is highly effective at starting conversations on a challenging topic and in, in it encourages participants to consider stormwater management strategies, land use decisions, and thinking beyond the boundaries of jurisdictional lines on a map. So you probably have a couple of questions with that intro. Uh, first, I'd like to address those questions uh, by covering who is CPEX, uh, answer the question, why did we make a watershed game in the first place? Um, and then I'd like to frame up the workshop that we do with uh, prior to this game, uh, and then talk about the game and then share some key takeaways and observations we've had while playing the game. Um, we are the state's only nonprofit organization that coordinates urban, rural, and regional planning efforts. Uh, we provide best practice planning models, innovative policy ideas, and master plans. Uh, and the big part of our focus is on data-driven planning, both quantitative and qualitative. Um, we're able to do this work because we have an experienced team with a diverse skill set of policy specialists, community planners, landscape architects, environmental scientists, and re resilience and adaptation experts. Second question, why did we make a watershed game? Well, we created the game to bring flood risk reduction measures in the form of policies and programs to the public, decision makers, stakeholders, just about anybody else you can think of. Uh, we wanted to raise awareness about, you know, as planners, we wanted to raise awareness about how our development patterns sometimes contribute to our flood risk. And finally, we created the game because this, in the state, there's a significant and demonstrated flood risk. More than half of Louisiana is a special flood hazard area. And because of outdated FEMA flood maps, land loss, relative sea level rise, we know that that's likely a conservative estimate. And this was clearly demonstrated in 2016, when two unnamed storm systems, one in March and one in August, dropped a lot of rain uh, across the state. 56 of 64 parishes were declared federal disaster areas. And the total cost estimates range from 10 to $15 billion in damages. In a state that's used to natural disasters that come from named storms, these two events in 2016 were a real eye-opener as to just how much flood risk there existed across the state, not just on the coast. So the state's response to those 2016 floods is the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. It was established through an executive order that created the Council on Watershed Management that tapped five state agencies with working together to improve floodplain management and reduce flood risk statewide. It's an explicit recognition that a more comprehensive approach to reducing flood risk is necessary, and it calls for a watershed-based floodplain management program. But there's a lot to unpack there. We know that a major component of watershed management, whether the focus is on water quality, water quantity, is land use, and those decisions are made locally. We also know that watersheds rarely conform to jurisdictional boundaries. So there's the challenge of coordinating across jurisdictions, not to mention negotiating existing top-down, bottom-up relationships. So as a planning organization in Louisiana, we knew we needed to get some insight into local needs as the statewide effort rolled out. So to do that, we conducted a lot of interviews with floodplain managers, building officials, elected officials, scientists, private industry, planners, other outreach organizations, uh, just to gauge local needs for an effort such as this. Uh, it was effectively an interview version of a needs assessment. What we heard all had the same common theme, education. Education for stakeholders, education for city council members, education for city and parish staff, education for the general public. 
So what did we do? We made an educational game uh, as an activity to do at a workshop setting. We knew it needed to be flexible, both to account for changing geographies and audience. We also knew we need a front end piece, an introduction to some of the concepts in the game, as well as background info on the challenges being addressed. So it's a game that comes with a lecture, how fun. Um, now this next several slides might be preaching to the choir, um, but they demonstrate the general subject matter we covered in workshops to help provide an introduction to the base level information uh, needed to fully engage in the game. You know, we have this uh, presentation at the front end, uh, and then as you play in the game, you're reintroduced to these ideas at the latter end. And so there's like a two points, uh, two touch points for learning some of these concepts and really thinking critically about them. So that first, of course, we introduce the concept of a watershed, real basic definition. It's the entire area that contributes water to flooding and storm events. Um, a big part of our focus is on flooding uh, as opposed to water quality, because that's the focus of Louisiana's approach. Um, but you could also convert, uh, easily have this be about water quality as well. Uh, then we briefly describe watershed management uh, as something that incorporates all land use and water management practices and policies within a watershed. It's really a holistic approach. Um, this requires a consideration of impacts of infrastructure projects, development, industry, land use, um, on water qual quantity, quality, water supply, and environmental quality. Uh, importantly, it forces you to think about upstream and downstream impacts, and uh, the important point we're trying to make here is that managing flood risk and managing storm water is not just limited to floodplains, uh, which brings us to floodplains. Now, this is a tricky one because people have generally heard the term, and there's a lot of different versions of uh, definitions of this, and people understand it to varying degrees, and for the most part, they may all be right. Now, some may give you the location-based topographic definition of the floodplain. Others may focus more on the composition of materials that make up a floodplain and give the geomorphological definition. Some may focus on how often the area is covered in water and give the hydrological definition. Others might be plant people and identify more closely with the ecological definition. Now, while none of these folks would be wrong with these definitions, they pose a problem for community decision-making. None of them give us much structure for making a decision in a community. They don't set a specific area, identify a rain event, or a quantity of water we're dealing with. For that, we need to go to the regulatory definition, the FEMA definition. It gives a specific area determined by a specific quantity of water. It's hydrologically based, and it guides local decisions and regulates activity, right? So this is that key distinction we're trying to make here. Floodplains are a regulated area. There's a responsible jurisdiction for floodplains. There are specific rules for floodplains. This is not always the case for watersheds. Okay? It's the exception to the rule. In most cases, there is no responsible jurisdiction at the watershed scale. Watershed management requires considering all of the actions and decisions made throughout the watershed. Uh, so not only does it require coordination across jurisdictions along the lines that water flows, uh, it will also involve decisions made in areas that typically are not associated with water management, such as housing, economic development, transportation. These are because some of the distinctions we really try and drive home in the, the front piece to the, uh, these workshops. The other big challenge revolves around a common question. Will it flood here? It seems like a simple question. People ask it all the time. It's the first question people ask uh, when they're buying a house, when some certain places, they might even be the first question to ask when they're parking their car. Um, it's also the question uh, the public or stakeholders want to know if you're having them in a workshop setting. Um, we know that to answer this, you need to know where here is, then you need to know how much rain falls, how fast it falls, where it falls, and the conditions on the ground when it falls. So once you know that, then you need to figure out how that quantity of water in that particular location, in those conditions, will move through and fill the landscape. We're talking, of course, about hydrology and hydraulics. Uh, so simply put, hydrology tells us how much uh, water will be generated in a particular place from a storm. Hydraulics tells us where that water will go, both horizontally and vertically. Now, this seems like a simple enough process. Uh, and the challenge there, the problem is that if people think it's a simple process, if they think it's a simple thing to figure out, then they may not appreciate the complexity of stormwater, or floodplain management, watershed management, what have you. Um, so in these workshops, I like to offer uh, up a tale of two dudes, particularly these two dudes. I ask who these people are. Now, at this point, I usually have a dramatic pause when people try and figure out who the other guy is. But since this is a recorded Zoom presentation, I'll just go right ahead and answer it. 
We all know the guy on the left is Albert Einstein. At least I hope we do from our grade school textbooks. The guy on the right, you might be able to tell by his nose, is Hans uh, Einstein. It's his son. He was a famous hydraulic engineering professor. His job was to figure out what water was going to do as it moved across the landscape. When reporters asked Albert what he thought of his son's career, he replied, he is working on a more difficult problem. So if you come to that question, will it flood here, and you think that doesn't seem too hard to figure out, remember, the guy whose name we use as a synonym for genius thought figuring out how water moves through a landscape was a more difficult problem than what he worked on. So with that in mind, and considering why this is considered a more difficult problem by, uh, by an Einstein, Remember, flood risk is determined by how much runoff is generated in a particular landscape under a certain amount of rainfall. Both of those change over time. More than just jurisdictional lines on a map that we talked about, we've changed a lot and continue to change a lot on the ground. Each land use decision alters the way water drains from the landscape, and some of those changes are very small. But a lot of very small decisions can add up to a big impact, and that can impact our flood risk. Additionally, we want to point out that other things change too. It's not just our, our changes to the landscape. There's the specific amount of rainfall part that needs to go into figuring out if it's going to flood here. Um, if you want to gauge how much flood water would be produced in a particular landscape, you need to know how much rain is going to fall. We base this on a defined storm event. We just define storm events based on how likely they are to occur. Uh, this is called a recurrence interval or a return period, but in the more common parlance, people hear about the 100-year storm. That's an example of a defined storm. And these estimates are based on historical records, but some of those records are incomplete. Uh, some of them may not be long enough to uh, not have a big margin of error. Uh, and majority of them don't count for, account for a changing climate. And finally, compounding all of that uh, is this challenge of de uh, determining how much rain is going to fall and the complexity of climate change. Warmer temperatures hold more water vapor. Um, what we're looking at here is statistics about very heavy rainfall events, defined as the heaviest 1%, 1% of all daily events in a year. Um, and those have increased nationally in recent decades. So that question, will it flood here, is really difficult to answer. We have a change, changing landscape, and climate change is challenging our ability to accurately identify how much rain is going to fall and how frequently that's going to happen. So answering that question is really hard to do, but that doesn't mean we can't come up with a strategy to manage our flood risk and take steps to reduce it over time, even with all this uncertainty. So how do we do that? So at this point in our workshops, we kind of transition to discussing common strategies to manage stormwater and flood risk, which is necessary to discuss so that participants are familiar with them uh, as they show up in the watershed game. So you'll recognize a lot of these. I'll kind of go through them a little quickly uh, because I think we're mostly familiar with them. Um, so that front piece, again, defines, discusses the broader idea of watershed management, differentiates it from floodplain management, and how we conceptualize flood risk. These next several slides are going to directly discuss stormwater management strategies that participants are soon asked to consider employing in the watershed game. So we have two basic approaches here. We can manage the water itself, or we can manage the impacts of the floods that we know happen eventually. Um, we have our traditional gray infrastructure. This is our, uh, our you know, our, our stormwater infrastructure. Um, it's typically man-made, uh, constructed assets. It's called gray infrastructure because it's usually made out of cement or concrete. Um, it's often watertight or impervious and designed with a single purpose. It's expensive to put in, expensive to maintain, but highly efficient. There's no quicker way to move water. Um, we talk about green infrastructure and how we're trying to recapture some natural processes or engineering features to mimic natural processes. Uh, it's been around a long time, but it's now it's growing in popularity as we realize we have a lot of opportunities to use it. Uh, works to restore natural water retention capacity to the landscape. Um, and it also provides additional benefits, some of which are never even factored into a cost benefit analysis when you're considering your approach to stormwater management. Um, we kind of highlight how gray infrastructure and green infrastructure aren't mutually exclusive. They often work together, as this example on the right. Um, we talk about different aspects of the built environment, from an individual rain barrel on a house to slow down that water from entering as a drain si drainage system, uh, to green roofs that kind of capture some stormwater before it ever gets to the ground. Uh, we kind of talk about things people would be familiar seeing in their neighborhood or at a shopping center, uh, a bioswale or a rain garden. 
we alert them to the importance of street trees or the specific design of, of, of rainwater trees on uh, urban in urban environments, and as we see in the picture on the right there. Um, we also want to make sure that they're aware that managing stormwater, managing flood risk doesn't always take place in front of their house or, or in, in an urban environment, right? We can reconnect floodplains. Uh, in this example here, we see a, a river that had a levee setback to make room for the river to reconnect those floodplains. Um, there's also the idea of conservation and restoration, right? Maintaining green space in urban areas and suburban areas and rural areas, uh, not draining wetlands, um, or you know, reclaiming some areas that may have uh, had homes built on them. Here's an example from New Orleans of some uh, properties that were turned back into uh, a, you know, a large water retention site um, that now is also a community amenity. So we're, you know, we're trying to drive home that there's a lot of options here. And then we move on to flood impacts, right? How do you manage flood impacts? Well, the best way to do it is to let people build in a, a risky place in, in the first place. Um, so zoning's a way of doing that, right? You make sure that people can't develop in any density in, um, in a place that's vulnerable to flood risk. Um, you know, then there's also environmental protection rules that preserve important habitat and helps buffer those floodwaters. Uh, we talk about housing design a little bit, or I guess building design, right? You can consider how they're built and you can, if you know that there's a flood risk, you can elevate them as we have a classic example from Louisiana here. Or, you know, unfortunately, some infrastructure is in a risky place and you have the option of flood proofing. Um, we're also, we also talk about managing flood impacts, right? So, you know, a lot of this development goes out and you have design standards for your development and how much you can fill in the floodplain or freeboard requirements. Um, and all of these regulations and development codes are just additional tools for accounting for uh, the management of flood impacts. What we're really trying to drive home with this front part is just that it's a complex issue. Uh, you can't just count on getting the water out of your community as quickly as possible, uh, and that there's a lot of strategies to dealing with this, and in, in the right hands, these strategies can complement one another. Um, we also want to get people to start thinking that, you know, there are unintended consequences to our decisions. Uh, there could be equity or environmental justice issues. Um, what, are, what are the results of our decisions, and, and how can we mitigate any negative consequences to that? Uh, you know, with climate change and relative sea level rise, especially in Louisiana, there's this challenge, you know, and growing communities and population increases. We, in a lot of ways, we can't look to the past to address future challenges. We have to come up with a new approach to that. Um, and then from a watershed management perspective, a watershed approach, we really are thinking about working across political lines and, and highlight this idea of, well, you know, if we all work together, perhaps we can come to a better, uh, a better end result. Um, so with all that, that kind of brings us to the watershed game. We developed this game to give anyone who's interested, landowners, elected officials, community uh, stakeholders, uh, the knowledge and tools to consider stormwater management decisions, uh, to understand programs and policies available for a comprehensive approach to managing stormwater, uh, and also to, you know, to serve Louisiana's goal of moving towards watershed, uh, a watershed approach to this, the potential for coordination across political boundaries to manage stormwater. Um, so to play the game, we take our workshop participants and have divided up into groups of no more than five or six people. That's a good size for making sure that they, nobody gets, uh, you know, everybody gets their voice heard and nobody really gets talked over. Um, and each are given one of three game boards that you'll see in a second that represent general land use context found across much of the country. Uh, so the game breaks it up into a rural community, a suburban community, an urban community. Um, and each area comes with a unique water management scenario, uh, and these can always be modified to better reflect local challenges wherever this workshop's being uh, held, um, or wherever the game's being played. Uh, so we highlight some things that happen in each of these uh, different uh, development contexts. So in rural areas, you may have wetlands drained and forest cleared uh, for agriculture, or maybe a few homes are built in low-lying areas. In suburban areas, we take that one step further. We go agricultural land turns into subdivisions and commercial developments. You had some fill brought in, you lost some natural areas, and then there's more impermeable surfaces. In urban areas, maybe roads are expanded, more parking lots are built, uh, buildings and homes got larger uh, and increased the amount of impermeable surfaces, and the limited amount of open space in the urban community was lost. Um, this part of the scenario came from a, one of the first workshops we did in which somebody had an issue with making these decisions uh, at the watershed 
uh, for, for the watershed um, in which um, there wasn't already public outreach and there wasn't communication and there, you didn't get input. So now we say, you are your community stormwater management planning committee. Uh, there have been extensive community public wide meetings and educational materials. And now it's up to you. You have the trust of your community to make this decision. So in our workshop, we use the Ameet watershed in Louisiana, but again, it's not specific to a particular watershed. Um, any watershed and combination of upstream to downstream regions can be used. In this case, it went from rural, downstream to suburban, downstream to urban. Um, we call them Ruralville, Suburbana, and Urbanopolis. Uh, and you know, you're responsible for making decisions how you manage your stormwater, and those decisions only apply to your area. Um, so the goal is to manage your water, which we represent with glass pieces that we count out for you within your budget. Use, we use poker chips for that. Uh, and then we've created a series of action cards in which the decisions you make are, are described on it, and there's costs and benefits for that. Uh, so the way the game's played, you kind of review these game materials to discuss those actions available. You prioritize which of those uh, programs or policies that you want to use uh, to build consensus. Um, and then you start laying them out on that board from your first you know, preference to, to lowest. Uh, you then pay for your actions and you see if you can take care of all the water you will have. Uh, do you consider using a regional policy or program? Uh, that comes a little later in the game once you realize you can't pay or if you can't account for all of your water. Um, and then there's a good discussion as a group of the benefits and trade-offs of the decisions made. And this all happens just in that uh, during the gameplay. Uh, so just to, to go through some of the action cards, to, to go through the action cards and, and the features on them, we, you know, we have our title. Uh, we have an indication if it's a program or a policy. Uh, we have a description of what that is, just to kind of return to that a little bit. We talk, we show them how much water it manages, and we share with them the cost. Um, on the back of the cards, we list some basic pros and cons um, of, of this strategy. And we also, on all of these cards, we have a, um, a, a regional comparison of costs. Um, so on this one, they're all the same, but in some areas, if you're conserving natural areas, you could say it costs more in an urban environment because land values are higher there. So we do, there is a, uh, uh, have a comparative advantage for certain strategies based on, on cost of uh, uh, land or availability of land. Um, so just to quickly go through the rest of the cards, we can, you can expand your drainage infrastructure, you can construct a large scale detention feature, uh, conserve natural areas and other open space. You have a program for private green infrastructure. You can implement public green infrastructure. You have private property buyouts. You can adopt freeboard. You can restrict fill in the floodplain. You can adopt or increase storm event design standards. Uh, everybody's favorite, you can increase community revenue through taxes or fees. Actually not the least favorite card in here. I believe that was property buyouts. Uh, you can conduct an educational campaign. This was another feature of the game that came out of a work, one of our first scoping workshops. And somebody said, you need an educational campaign so that we can build support behind some of these other programs. Um, we also have a blank card. We don't claim to be omniscient and lots of people have good ideas. So all of these materials are laminated. And, uh, people are encouraged to write all over them with um, uh, dry erase markers to provide some feedback on that. We can adopt a regional policy. Uh, so once you get through the game, uh, you have regional options available. Facilitators encourage your table to explore those options to see if they can come up with a more efficient or less costly way to manage their stormwater. Uh, the one condition is that all the jurisdictions have to participate in that coordination. So if you put forward a policy or a program, everybody has to agree on this. And it's interesting seeing everybody kind of debate which ones they should. Um, and then this is also encouraged by kind of cooking the books at the front end so that you either have not enough funds or not or too much water uh, you know with the game pieces to make to create buyers and sellers of this uh, of, of, of programs and policies. Uh, again we have a blank one for a regional strategy in, so, in case somebody comes up with something better. Um, and then the conversations that happen both in a report out and at the table are things like who benefits and loses from these strategies, what are the short-term and long-term costs, uh, who bears the cost of maintenance or compliance of your choices? Um, how might they impact economic development? And then who bears or shares the costs from regional coordination? Well, 
we found this game does in a really enjoyable way is start the conversation that educates people on options through an engaging activity that requires prioritization of a broad selection of strategies. That's a really valuable takeaway. You don't just end up with a list of what people want, you end up with a list of preferences that have been weighed against a variety of other options. Um, these re they've been a really great vehicle for talking about watershed management strategies with groups whose inter interests might not obviously intersect. Uh, it does a good job of starting from a common ground. We've hosted these workshops with a range of participants, various NGO partners, uh, housing organizations, even grade school students. Uh, each group tailors the gameplay and discussions slightly to better fit their own interests. In interests. For instance, when we played with uh, the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, um, they generated a great conversation about how policies and programs to manage water intersect with housing affordability and who really shoulders the cost for implementation and enforcement. Um, some additional takeaways that we, we've had, some observations. Um, players often assume roles representing diverse voices within the community, whether that's developers, elected officials, homeowners, or just John Q. taxpayer. Uh, we find that communication is key, right? Players requested cards, like conduct an educational campaign. Um, and then actions are also, also often coupled, right? People are looking at these and they say, well, the only way we're doing buyouts is if we also conserve natural areas. And so they kind of have contingencies in there. Uh, also, some people do come in and they play to win. They just look at that cost benefit uh, analysis, but almost always uh, there's somebody else at their table that challenges them and who are really considering the consequences of decisions. Um, we were often surprised by the depth of discussion on the relationships between certainly uh, uh, certain strategies, uh, like what's elevation got to do with floodplain management. People want to discuss those. Um, also, every game has been different, depending on who sits at the table, different geographies, different types of users, different politics, all of the above. And then finally, when I asked my coworkers, what are your takeaways from this? This is my favorite response. It's, uh, dudes, let's work together. Uh, so there's always a moment in every game where people realize they're going to have to make some tough decisions to manage their water. Uh, remember, we cook the books ahead of time. Uh, and they reassess their decisions and they look to the regional options. Uh, and that's when the negotiating and the, the fun starts uh, and the reasoning takes place. Some groups like to play hardball. Others want to capitalize on the opportunity to get rid of a program or policy that they're not too fond of. Uh, as a facilitator, hearing folks argue for or against certain strategies, hearing them articulate their viewpoints, is a very gratifying and useful outcome. Um, so with that, I'll close by saying these workshops have been hosted and played, uh, that, that we've hosted and played. The games have been great. Participants have engaged, debated, they've learned. Uh, it's been really rewarding as a facilitator. And as I've, I've also learned uh, from the game uh, that they, their takeaway is uh, they often have a much more positive outlook on, on what they're doing. So I wanna thank you uh, for your attention and thanks once again to the ASF. Justin, thank you for that great presentation. I have a few questions that have come in through the chat. One of the first one is, coming from Nevada, how is this a game? Do people win cash? Otherwise, it seems more like a tabletop exercise. So I think they'd like a distinction between this game and a tabletop exercise. Uh, sure, it's a, you can consider it just a tabletop exercise, but most of the games I play, I don't win cash in them. So I, I, I can't really get on board with that. Um, it's a game because you're everybody sits down at these tables and they look at the different groups sitting around them and that, you know, you put some numbers in front of them, some money, and they want to most effectively manage their stormwater in the way that uh, that makes the most sense to them. Uh, and it, ultimately, they want to wind up being um, sellers of stormwater uh, retention if they can. They they don't really want to, you know, still have flood risk or still have un unaccounted for, uh, you know, water chips in front of them uh, compared to their their partners. So it it even though they're not winning cash, there's no it it in encourages that kind of competition in a really in a way that gets people to think about all of these options that are out there. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, have you thought about creating a digital version of this mobile browser that people could play anywhere? That's a great idea. Um, we'll, we'll explore that. We'd like to. Uh, we kind of made this at the end of last summer, uh, have kind of been doing some workshops and, and using it as much as we can. Uh, but a digital version would be great. Um, how you would get the, in terms of a digital version, what I think would be more difficult, maybe not now that everybody's on Zoom, um, is 
having those conversations at a table um, where you can kind of sit there and hear different perspectives from different folks. Um, so you might lose a little bit of that, um, but you could certainly run through a game like this on your own and, and find out what your own priorities are. Okay, another question we have that's come in is, what are you, the best practices you've identified for better integrating floodplain and watershed ordinances and the permitting process? I saw that question in the chat. Um, so a best practice for getting ordinances into permitting process uh, or for a community, I, I had a little trouble understanding where they're coming from on this. Um, I will say that the best practices that we came across for the folks that we interviewed to identify a need for a game like this or for ed that education is, uh, you know, we have building officials and floodplain managers that have regular meetings with council members, especially when the uh, council members may turn over um, to talk about those challenges and to highlight all of their options, um, in which case they're more likely to be uh, have, have buy in and get, be understood and recognize the long term consequences of those actions. Um, I hope that answers your question. Another one that someone's asked about is how does the game deal with the political costs? Um, something more higher standards, they say don't have a financial cost necessarily or stormwater utility, but the political costs can be significant and political regime change, their concern could occur because of that. So does the game take political costs into account in some regard? That is a great question. And so in, in developing this game, we went back and forth on how to cost out a lot of these uh, programs or policies. And ultimately we decided passing a policy doesn't cost it anything to a community except, you know, well, it does. So, but it forces that conversation on, and especially in that facilitated, uh, it, as a facilitator, you, you force that conversation of who's actually bearing the cost of a policy, uh, who, who's reaping the benefits. Um, you discuss those political costs. So I, I think I mentioned that buyouts are the least popular thing in there. And that was both from uh, a political perspective as well as uh, you know, a homeowner perspective. Um, they didn't want to have to do that, but then they, they start to negotiate with, well, different policies. Well, you don't like this one, but we can bring this one in. And you kind of see some wheeling and dealing within a group at the table. Um, and those conversations come out in the game. But ultimately, we had to try and find a, a, a common thread throughout all of the costs and benefits that made sense um, because we couldn't have political costs or uh, you know like added costs for developers for some of these policies in some of the cards but not in some of the other uh, in, in, in the others. All right well a couple other small quick quick questions. One does it come in a printable kit or do you have a printable kit for the game? The other is how long does the game typically take to play? Um, we had it printed up. Uh, we could probably find a way to, to make that happen for folks. Uh, we've played it as quickly as 45 minutes. You really want to give people enough time to sit and digest and they're going to have more questions when they sit down about some of these, uh, some of the cards um, and then they can talk through them and, and get some of those answers. And it's, you can t take it up to an hour and 15, an hour and a half, just depending on how, how many people you have, the kinds of discussions and the things that they're, um, they're trying to address in, um, in the workshop. Great, is there a place online where they can go to learn a little bit more about the game and see screenshots or is there a website uh, link you can share? Uh, we, we, it's not up on our, uh, on cpex.org, our website yet. You can shoot me an email and we can, I can share some more um, materials and we can discuss it further. And I think the last question really is, how do you get community elected officials to participate? So we all have probably dealt with situations where it's hard to get them to spend more than five minutes listening to a presentation. Do you have kind of an abridged version or what are your best strategies for that? Uh, a, a good strategy would be to have this with a group of stakeholders and have them stop in to see the engagement and, and really kind of see it. Um, people get caught up, you know, they see a bunch of people actively engaging and discussing, standing around a table, and then all of a sudden they're interested. They see that buy-in just to this game and the concepts on it. Um, and so, uh, that was a big thing that motivated us to put something like this together was they said we need a you know something that's going to bring education to uh, elected officials and let them really understand the scope of options um, for for watershed man or water management in their communities great and actually there's one more that came through university of minnesota they said has a game with the same name they're wondering is there any relation uh the University of Minnesota is a C grant. We talked with them. They have, it's a water, it's not what are you going to do? That's our game. Okay. 
theirs is a, a game of watershed management. It's a great game. Theirs is more focused on water quality, whereas coming from Louisiana and uh, we're fo there's a push in the state to really go to a watershed management approach towards floodplain management. Uh, and so ours was kind of more focused on water quantity as opposed to quality. But we sat with uh, C Grant, played the game with them, thought it was really interesting, got some good lessons from them, and, um, and it really helped us with the development of our game. That's great. Well, it seems like a lot of people are interested in getting more information. So I don't know at some point you can share that through ASFPM. Um, or you can probably contact you, Justin Kozak, correct, at your um, yep. email address to get yep. more information directly? Yeah, uh, that's jkozak, J-K-O-Z-A-K, at cpex.org. Great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and the last thing I'd say, you've got some proponents returning it into a commercial game, so it might be okay. something you to look at, too. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time today. All right, the next presentation we have is from Dan Henderson, and he's the regional sales manager for Esri. The title of his presentation is Utilizing Location Technology for Flood Preparedness Management, Recovery and Resilience. And Hello, and thanks so much for joining. My name is Dan Henderson. Um, I'm the regional sales manager for Esri in Northern California, Northern Nevada. As a former CFM and presenter at ASFPM, it's an honor to be back talking to you about the technology that's helping so many of our customers solve flood problems by being more prepared, more effective at communicating risk. What I'm going to show you today is technology that a lot of you guys already own. So that's pretty exciting. Let's take a peek at what we're going to talk discuss today. So um, we want to talk about flood manage management and location intelligence. What are some of the current trends and capabilities? How can you improve your CRS scores? Or if you're not in the CRS, how do you get in there and, and create a great set of savings for your constituents? Talk about analytics, measuring what matters. What are some of the funding sources that are out there right now, both COVID and ongoing through FEMA? And then what's next, sort of the road to resiliency? So traditionally, folks in our profession have mapped floodplains. We've done this for a long time. Some of it's through institutional knowledge, some of it's through um, actual technology and through um, engineering studies. But what we haven't done as well is look at the entire picture using the latest available technology. Um, and really to do that to help, do, uh, help us do our jobs more effectively. And in some ways, we haven't even changed how we manage events since the 1800s. So how do we change that? Um, we need to better utilize technology that you may own and that FEMA already uses as well. So what are some of the common issues? A lot of these things are going to be uh, items that aren't new to people that are, that are on the call, but these are places that we've looked at as a company and we've created solutions around them. So there's a lack of predictive modeling capabilities to help create um, flood response plans a lot of ineffective methods of, of communicating flood impact to our stakeholders. So whether that be a lack of um, websites that are available on mobile devices uh, that are easy to read since the majority of folks are getting their information through mobile devices these days. Difficult to getting useful flood depth data during an event. Um, it causes information latency. Um, lack of actual um, information during a chaotic response and Oftentimes, it's a reactive approach um, that costs lives and results in severe economic impact. And then the other part we hit on a little bit earlier was that difficulty in securing funding um, because you have inadequate flood impact analysis. Um, these are the issues, and all these can be approved through the use of location intelligence. So what are some of the solutions? So this is a uh, sort of a, a little bit of an eye chart showing the different types of solutions that we've created um, as Esri as a company. Um, that apply to the different phases of, of flood planning, response, and recovery and mitigation. And so these are all um, solutions that we've built that are available. So if you have just a desktop or a RTS online user account, you've got access to the majority of these, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, so if you haven't talked to your technology experts or folks in other departments that are utilizing uh, Esri technology, make that a point as part of your homework today to do that. So how can it be used in flood planning? Well, again, you want to be able to define your flood impact areas at each flood stage. Um, you want to determine what impact assets are going to be impacted, and then you want to communicate those results to your stakeholders. 
And then um, the last one, I'll, I'll have a bunch of caveats here, a heavy asterisk that you can still create hard copy operations maps for first responders, but most first responders have got mobile devices and all of our mobile apps work offline. So you can have folks download that information and data that is current based on the last time they were connected to Wi-Fi. And more and more we're seeing an emergency response that we have mobile Wi-Fi. And so they'll have accessibility to those hotspots. Um, and then if they go out in areas that have less coverage, they can still have as up-to-date data as they can get on their smart device tablet or PC. So what are some of the current trends? Some of these aren't new again, but what we're now seeing is true 3D modeling. So this is an example from Hurricane Harvey um, and the impact scene um, you know, in Austin. And traditionally, even though it looks a little bit of cartoonish, we were actually showing real data, real depth. And part of this is due to a couple of things. One, it's better modeling software, it's better data models. And then it's also due to um, much better elevation data. So we're seeing a lot of communities fly LIDAR to give us much more accurate uh, reading and understanding of what the true elevation models are, uh, true or surface elevation models, another way to refer to it. Um, using this stuff leverages our desktop and our, our higher end analytics kit components. What are some of the data requirements you need? So you've got to have your, your water surface elevation raster. Um, you've got to have your 3D flood uh, surface. Um, or have your um, your depth raster and a digital elevation model along with that water surface raster and that 3D flood surface. And that's a mock-up of what it's gonna look like. The other thing that we're starting to see more and more as well is better bathymetry data. So we can understand what the channels look like right now um, and it's getting easier to scan those. Some of the other things that we're seeing very frequently are dashboards. So this is not anything new. I think most folks have, have, have seen dashboards or use dashboards. They're very easy information products to utilize, but are you using those easy to deploy pieces of technology? So you're, here you're seeing an example from Douglas County, Nebraska, um, spring of 2019. And they use this to show the number of roads and bridges that were impacted, um, any debris removal that was going on. So it's a very easy uh, information product for folks to read and be able to then um, give that up to the public. Um, you can also utilize this stuff internally. We see these dashboards a lot at, in emergency operations centers. Um, and then an example of a, of a tweet here um, where we talk about the, the damage assessment solution that was deployed for the first responders to capture the preliminary roadway and building damage assessment. So let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about improving your CRS score um, because all these things factor into it. So, Who's doing it well? Um, I just gave a couple examples, two of which I work with currently, Roseville and Sacramento County, but also Pinellas County, Florida. Um, we, you know, when you look at the list and we see the ratings, we know the folks that are the twos and threes and then Roseville at the one. Um, but what are they doing to improve that? So when we think about location and location intelligence, it's that steel thread that's applicable actually to every section of the CRS. Um, flooding happens somewhere, properties are a location on the surface of the earth. Um, and so being able to utilize those spatial technology tools to manage and compile that CRS submittal and verification is really important. The other thing that we're, we're also proposing we're starting to see customers do is actually tie it to a digital local hazard mitigation plan. So every five years you have to do that update, why not put it in a, in a digital format? Um, we use a technology called Story Maps enables you to display that and then it's continuously updated as you have events. You're not having to recreate and reinvent the wheel every five years. And so you end up saving money on the back end with consultants who actually use this technology as well. I talked about Roseville and just some of the things that they're doing. This is just a quick snapshot of a public outreach information product. So if folks want to do a parcel search and this ties into the second bullet point about collaborating with your, your developer community. Folks want to go and do development and they want to know where those properties are. And so um, the city's actually put into their charter, um, they've made it, um, you know, they've identified areas that absolutely will not be built in. Um, in addition, some other things I didn't put on the bullet points, but Roosevelt's done a great job of returning channelized areas into natural floodplain. And they did this primarily in response to flood events in 95. 
um, in 96. And they very quickly got up to speed and, and got down to a one rated community due to a concerted effort between the city, again, collaborating with their stakeholders so that there's um, also very good communication with folks that want to do development. They know right out of the gate what are areas that they're not going to be able to build. And that makes it a much easier uh, conversation when you, you've you already identified areas that are in and out because they are also taking into account areas that they can build. So um, very, um, very good work they're doing um, at the city. We talked about a digital uh, local hazard mitigation plan. So this is an example that one of my colleagues, Shelly Hines, developed. Um, she's out of our Colorado office and um, being able to take that mitigation planning process and you know, you build the planning team, you review the capabilities, you conduct the risk assessment, and develop that mitigation strategy, and then implement it. Um, there's actually no requirement from FEMA to do a PDF or, God forbid, a paper submittal. Um, so being able to do this in a digital format is actually very much um, allowed by FEMA. And this is leveraging um, our RTS hub technology. So a variety of different apps you can you put in there. Um, you see the follow or unfollow button in here. This allows your constituents and stakeholders to actually follow this initiative and this activity and then also contribute information uh, to it as well with your trusted collaborators. So really great tool to do that. Um, you know, continue to talk about it. Um, you can actually publicize those upcoming meetings. So there's calendaring events associated with it. Um, you can provide feedback whether you're there or not there. And that's a big key, particularly in the, the situation we're in now with COVID where folks are working from home, but that hasn't changed. Um, if you think about public meetings, oftentimes you get very poor attendance because people are busy. When you are utilizing RTS Hub and that constituent engagement technology enables folks that are a much better cross-section of the community to actually contribute comments, um, Oftentimes, you've got experts in the field that may want to uh, attend and, and contribute information about um, properties that they deem, um, you know, should be in or out of floodplains. Also, looking for think people like willing sellers um, and be able to get that information out and make sure that 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 data is available to everyone that wants it, both in an information product like we'll see here in a map, um, but also folks that have got um, access to the, the higher end desktop and server technology. So. What can you do to improve your score? So I just made a couple quick notes on the different sections. Um, I, I've had some really good conversations with, the, with Rozo and with Brian Walker, who's the floodplain manager there. And one of the things that he talked to me about was that it's really difficult to compile that information. So when we think about um, that verification process, um, just making sure that it's digital um, ensuring that as much of the information that you have can be in that digital format and it's not being collected. I don't even, I mean, spreadsheet's digital, but it's not, um, it's not automated. So there's ways to make sure that some of these things are automated and makes it easier and, and, and speeds up that verification process. Um, section 300, which is public information. So um, you know, a lot of folks have put out a, an existing floodplain data set um, but then actually conducting those outreach activities, recording them and putting it in, in, in um, where it lives in perpetuity on the web. Um, 400 is the easiest um, cross section to, to, uh, to GIS and mapping and location intelligence because it's the actual mapping and regulation. So it's not just publishing those maps, but it's also looking at um, you know, things like risk maps. Um, what are, what's the real risk that folks are looking at? So not just the base flood elevation, um, but also what are the other impacts we're seeing? Um, some of the other things that were happening now too, like when we use Hurricane Harvey down in Texas were areas that flooded that were not mapped. And so that's another way to, uh, to think about that. Um, flood damage reduction. So you know, prioritizing either property relocations, um, prioritizing properties that are, um, you know, the, uh, um, the repetitive loss properties, those are some of the easy ones. Um, and then warning and response. So a lot of our apps that we've created are around a warning and response. So it could be evacuation maps that you're able to update, shelter maps, um, internally, where are you staging your equipment so that's out of harm's way, but still close, uh, close enough for folks to access once that flood, um, that flood risk is reduced and you can get in there and start helping people. 
Um, same thing with the, the damage assessment and, and being able to go in after and identify those areas that, that need, to be, um, need to be repaired or assessed and then um, submitted then for um, FEMA funding and reimbursement. So the reason that, that geospatial technology and geographic information systems were created was to do spatial analytics. And when we talk about measuring what matters, it's, it's really oftentimes that human cost. So, and human being, you know, things, economic losses, um, and really the things that are preventable. So maybe a question you might want to ask yourself is, has the pro are your current processes changing behavior? And if they're not, what are the things that you need to do? So how do you incentivize your community to be, get involved with that, that outreach and, and mitigation planning? Um, how do you ensure that they're, they're aware and understand um, the process that you put on as part of your building permitting and things like that? Um, one of the other big things that's really um, improved of late is utilizing real-time data and predictive major, measures. So um, the 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 Weather Service and, and, um, and NOAA have got a really fantastic stream gauge data set. In addition to that, they've got a predictive stream height um, data set that's based on existing forecasts. And so you can actually stream that web service, web mapping stream gauge service and stream height um, uh, into any of your applications. So as you're creating your um, evacuation maps and things like that, you've got a really good understanding of where what's happening now and what's potentially going to happen in the next seven to 14 days. We hit on repetitive loss properties already. So not only identifying those frequent flood areas, but what are those potential new flood zones like we saw happen in Hurricane Harvey? And then really creating true risk assessment based both on location and time. So location involves X, Y, and Z, right? So areas that our true high ground areas that maybe previously were but are no longer. Um, we deal with that a lot in the Central Valley in California with subsidence in areas that have sunk below base flood elevation but haven't been studied in, in uh, you know, 10 years or more. So those are some of the places where we're trying to have an impact and, and improve that data set. So let's talk about funding. What are the different funding sources? So I threw together some things and I threw the CARES Act on top, but um, that's just because there's a lot of a lot of funding available right now and based on uh, um, current situation with COVID. But the FEMA Public Assistance Program. So some of you folks that have had experienced um, damage and ex experienced disasters have utilized this. So um, a, a few keys to this, um, and I got some great tips from my colleague Dana Carey, who's the OES manager in Yolo County here, um, just west of Sacramento. Um, making sure you follow your your existing um, procurement processes. Um, make sure that you document the heck out of it. Um, and this is available for services work, time spent, anything that's a direct impact based on that event. So with COVID, obviously, a lot of emergency operations centers are, are activated for the foreseeable future. But with most other events, like flood events, it's a, there's a, usually a, a discrete start and stop. There's the emergency performance grants. Um, I put a link to the grant field manual if you haven't seen it. Um, some other potential sources too, there may be some um, money for in the community development block grants, and then some states like California actually have funding as well to help offset that that match, that local match, um, often the, the 75% federal, 25% local match. So um, finding ways to, to, to bridge that gap. So I wanted to hit on uh, some points specific to ESRI and you know, our company was founded 51 years ago to solve some of the world's most difficult problems. So when a disaster does strike, we are here to support you. Um, we, we created um, 26 years ago, and actually our first event that we really responded to in force was the Northridge earthquake in 94. And so when your capacity is exceeded, we have what we call our disaster response program. So this is a, a way for folks to um, get temporary access to software, um, we also have services packages, um, lots of different resources, data, and technical support um, that also includes what we call our premium support, um, which is all of our after-hours 24-7 support. Um, and that helps support your, your organization's response efforts. One key point I want to make, the DRP is not, a, is not your disaster plan. 
Um, it's a way to augment what you're already doing. I wanna really emphasize that the biggest thing that you can do as an organization is have these apps um, stood up and ready to go in your emergency operations center and your field workers that are gonna be out there during flood fight, um, that they're prepared, they're trained, and they have access to all the data, maps, and applications that they're gonna need when that event occurs, no matter where it occurs. So um, think of this as a, an augment to what you guys are already doing in terms of your response uh, and how, how we can help you guys do it better. So what's next? Well, one of the things that you wanna do, and I, I call this homework and takeaways, and this is also one of the things that I sort of call on your road to resilience. Um, the things that are gonna help you during the event that'll help you move forward. So what do you own now? So most cities and counties throughout the country and also state agencies and federal have at least ArcGIS desktop, which means you have access to ArcGIS online. So that means you own the solutions that are part of that link right there and that solutions.arcgis.com. So that's pretty awesome. Um, you know, we've developed a, a, a series of these things that people can use today and start testing and deploying. The other thing is you wanna learn from the agencies that are leading. Now, I made a point of discussing Roseville that even, even some of the best rated agencies in the CRS still have trouble compiling and managing the program. It takes a lot of time, and I know that's oftentimes a barrier for people getting into the CRS is just the amount of time it takes, but um, leveraging the solutions that we have now that we're, we've got out of the box, plus even others you can do on your own are gonna help you manage and streamline that process. So you're saving time and money for your agency and then that great cost savings that you're getting to all your constituents that are purchasing uh, insurance, um, that's gonna be the other key to it, which is great things. Your elected officials love to do that. They love to talk about that, especially when they're, going to, they're up for reelection. Um, and the other key point is that location is that steel thread. I think I hit on that before. It connects all of the elements of the CRS and flood management as a whole. So think about how do you connect people? Where do things occur? It's all about where. Um, and then, you know, more importantly, when. You know, when is that event gonna occur? So whether it's a, a hurricane, um, when it comes on shore, when is that storm surge gonna occur? When is that gonna recite? Um, um, when are you gonna have, uh, you that tide going back down. Um, if, you know, when you have some of those um, triple threats of high tides, um, you know, high flood event, um, high stream area, and then an impact of, of, you know, those wind events too. Those are really, really difficult things. Um, this is an image from New Bern, North Carolina last year. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up and I'll be excited to take questions. Thanks so much for your time. And I will be talking to everybody soon. Well, thank you, Dan, for that great presentation. We have a couple of questions. We're gonna keep it a little bit limited for time's sake, but the first one is, how are the WSEL grids imported into the scene and what format are the rasters in to be uploaded to the AGO? Um, I mean, there, it's ESRI format, but you can convert from just about anything that you're using. Um, we, we've got a lot of tools that allow you to, to interchange between you know, an ESRI format and other um, open, open formats. And um, next one, is there a way to implement WSEL results data imagery on Google Street View? Yeah, you could export it out there if you wanted to. Okay. And last one, where can we find the predictive tool from National Weather Service? Uh, I don't have it handy, but if you just, I'm, what's the name of it? It's the, um, it's, I think it's like the seven day predictor. They, it's usually where you find the, um, uh, the, the, the current stream DH data and then that other service, the, the predictive one is on the same place. I can I can dig it up and, and shoot it out to you. Okay, well, that's all the questions we received. So thank you very much for your presentation and your time. Oh, definitely, thank you guys. All right, the next presentation we have is John Covey. He's an associate project manager at Wood and his presentation is using augmented reality to communicate flood risk and risk management solutions. And we'll go ahead and start the presentation. Hello, thanks for having me. My name is John Covey and I work for Wood. Uh, this presentation is about using augmented reality to communicate flood risk and risk management solutions. 
I have been with Wood for, or and its former names, AMEC, AMEC Buster Wheeler, for 15 years. Um, my key responsibilities are, are project management, water resources engineering, including advanced hydrology and hydraulic practices, and then fin finally innovation development and, and programming. Really bringing technology to the forefront of how we communicate, how we in and engineer our flood risk products. For this presentation, I'm going to go over a brief overview of our communication history. Um, I'm going to talk about how it relates to flood risk and resiliency communication, introducing some emerging tools of today, including virtual reality and augmented reality, its history, um, and then also how you can utilize virtual reality, um, some of its pros and cons, how you can utilize augmented reality and some of its pros and cons. But please keep in mind this presentation is geared more towards augmented reality and I will discuss the difference between the two. Um, I'm going to provide some lessons learned of an actual project um, that we have been working on um, uh, in the Wichita, Kansas area, as well as some lessons learned and conclusion of, of, that, uh, of that project. So as you can imagine, and as you, most of you know, our communication capabilities have really uh, taken off. Um, yeah, thinking back all the way to cave paintings and stone ca carvings to, to the common era of today, you know, the telegraph and the mid 1800s and telephone in the late 1800s, all the way through, you know, not too long ago, we, we didn't even have uh, cell phones. Um, and the internet was just uh, just coming on board in the in the 1970s 1980s and really you know it, it from that point it really launched into today's capabilities which are are just logarithmically or exponentially growing into the future and our world is changing fast um, even today with COVID-19 we are learning more and more how we can utilize our digital technology to enhance our environment to communicate and, and this is and this is also important for flood risk as well for flood risk and, and resiliency communication communication is a key component of the entire flood risk process the symbol there on the left is actually taken from the FEMA website. And as you can see, and I think it appropriately depicts this, is community outreach, education, and risk communication revolve around the entire process. It is a primary component, and it's key to ensuring that we are developing flood risk products that communities believe in. As a, as a consultant, we're not here to just create flood risk products. We here, we're here to create flood, flood risk products that the community can believe in and, and, and wants to mitigate and make their communities more resilient from. Um, some examples of that are, you know, discovery meetings, uh, talking with the community up front about the, the process, um, talking through the kickoff meeting, and maybe some of the modeling methods that we are utilizing. Flood study review, looking at those initial mapping products, does the community believe in? Does it reflect reality? And, and it's, and it's uh, something that the community wants to um, regulate to, all the way through the public open house. But there's much, much more, and, and I think that's where this presentation leads to, is that it'll talk about some of those tools uh, um, that we are currently using, as well as how we're expanding them. So traditionally, um, as most of you know, we had done in-person meetings, newsletters, uh, newspaper articles are usually a, a, a common platform. Developing simple maps that we can take to the communities, sit down, draw on, scratch on, scribble on, email, phone, and even outreach websites have all been traditional tools of the trade. Um, and depending on where we're at, you, you select the tool that's most appropriate for that, that location. 
And it, today, even, we are we're ever steadily changing, too. I mean, uh, with the growth of two-dimensional modeling and how prevalent it is becoming in, in our industry, it provides even more capability to communicate flood risk through animations, through a broad um, depiction of flood risk in the community, um, velocities, all the other byproducts are important pieces of how we can communicate flood risk, how we can communicate resiliency, and ultimately how we can mitigate against those. So tools continue to evolve. Um, and what this presentation is to talk about is the virtual reality, or VR, and augmented reality, AR. Um, here are just a couple definitions the, and, and that describes the key differences between these two applications. For virtual reality, it's really a computer-generated simulation or a, a three-dimensional environment was created, um, a synthetic environment in which the user can then interact with. Whereas augmented reality, it's really about enhancing the reality um, of a user. In other words, the user is standing in an environment, but we're using uh, digital images and technology to overlay that with that environment and really enhance the experience to the user. Using that same communication timeline that we saw before, I thought I would show events in VR and AR history uh, throughout this time timeline. In 1838, stereopsis was generally introduced. And stereopsis is basically utilizing visual information um, derived from uh, the two eyes of individuals who, who normally develop binocular vision, really creating the perception of depth and three-dimensional structure. The first VR machine was introduced in 1956. And the funny thing is, it was so large that up to four people could stand inside of it at the same time. Stereo vision glasses um, and, and wearable tech began to surface in you know, the early 1980s. And really, since the mid-2000-2010 time frame, VR has continued to emerge at an exponential rate. For VR, the first head-mounted display, or HMD, was kind of introduced in 1968, but it was quite the ordeal. It had wires hooked up to computers, and, and as you can imagine at that time, it wasn't exactly the most user-friendly device. Augmented reality was initially turned, or the, that term was coined in 1990, and since the similar time frame as VR, AR has been also emerging exponentially. The first web-based AR toolkit was kind of introduced in 2009. And since then, there are a ton of tools and applications that are available to users today. So how can you use VR? Well, one way is just using it as a digital consultation tool. Um, here's an example of, of how it might be utilized today, where you can create staging areas with information, banners, um, opportunities to sign in to meetings or provide feedback. Um, and then moving uh, on, you can, you can actually set up um, environments where you can attend virtual meetings and people can participate and communicate via, via virtual means. Um, and then finally, you can interact with other features and maps and even, and even combine this with uh, uh, other virtual reality applications, dropping yourself into um, a local, localized area and looking at flood risk. Um, those are all possibilities of VR and digital consultation. It, really, it's a very innovative um, field. And really, your imagination is all that uh, will hold us back from it. Um, it can be developed independently, which is which is powerful. Um, but the uh, but one of the problems that we'll talk about is that it, it can kind of be lonely. Um, it's not necessarily immersive with the environment around you. You you have to bring that environment to you, and the more you enhance that environment, the better you better experience you have. 
So some of the pros with virtual reality is it's you know ease of development. There's a lot of tools out there like City Engine and some and some of those others that really make it simple to set up a virtual reality environment. Um, you can develop it uh, independent of weather conditions. We'll talk about this with augmented reality um, as a as a con actually. But you know it, if you want to sit in your in your office somewhere and and, and experience experience uh, another location, you can do that with virtual reality, and you can develop it within a controlled environment. Um, whereas if you're standing out next to a river, as you can imagine, anything can happen. Somebody can walk in front of you. Um, it can start raining. Whatever. Um, there's a wide variety of applications for VR. I'm focusing on flood risk uh, as our example, but certainly uh, training. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of applications out there on how to uh, provide operations and maintenance of equipment. Um, those are certainly other applications. And, and it can be done remotely from, as I mentioned before, anywhere really. Um, I, uh, with COVID, this COVID-19, this is a perfect example of where we can utilize VR to enhance our communication skills with and still being safe uh, even during COVID-19. So um, that's a really great example of this. Some of the cons though is, and some of this is perception, uh, honestly, but I think that there is a perception that there's a loss of personal connection. We, we, we create these virtual environments and, and we can try to bring others into it and make it more uh, personal, but, but in by large, it, it can feel uh, independent and individualized and, and, we're, and less collaborative in a way. Um, also for some users, it's just not something they wanna utilize. You know, I'm, I'm just a good old farm boy from, uh, southeast Kansas and and you know you take some of this uh, wearable tech these goggles to some of those users in those areas I mean it's hard enough to get uh, to get some of my friends to want to even have a smartphone phone necessarily getting them to wear a goggle um, can <laughs> can be a challenge to say the least um, so I think I think that user acceptance is, is a potential con for this the other thing is, is there's a lot, there is a lot of hardware and opportunity uh, out there to you to develop and use VR, but uh, there's a variety of capabilities and and the VR platform standards are really in the early adoption phases and and as those continue to uh, uh, evolve. And um, I think that, that those platforms will become more standard and so that you can utilize multiple devices across, across the platform as opposed to picking a device and having to use its platform. Um, so creating that common platform, I think, is, will be a key for virtual reality to continue to grow uh, in practice. So this presentation is more geared for augmented reality. And so with that, I thought I would provide some example, uh, example use cases and, and flood risk for augmented reality. And then here, here soon, I'll, I'll have an actual video of the, that application. Um, one is just simply show the flood risk. Where is the water levels? How deep does it get? Um, you know, what buildings are inundated and not? We can depict historical storms and, and what kind of impact that they had in that environment. Um, you know, one of the challenges with uh, flood risk, honestly, is, is you have an event and you may not mitigate for a variety of reasons, but it, it can kind of um, leak out of everybody's minds. They, they, they don't remember necessarily its, its true impact that it had, and therefore it becomes less of a priority. Um, with something like this, it can keep it at the forefront of what happened, and, and it can really help enhance the need for mitigation and resiliency. We can depict climate change impacts or even depict how mitigative actions impact the environment around us. Um, you can toggle on and off, you know, what happens if you build that upstream detention or if you channelize this stream, how does the, how does flood risk change um, due to those impacts? 
We can evaluate channel stability uh, uh, information. In the realm of 2D modeling today, um, we get very, very good depictions of uh, velocity and shear stress and, and all that information is, is you know, uh, out there and so we can actually put that into this AR platform and you can highlight where channels may be eroding or, or highly erodible during certain events and it can really provide um, information um, supplemental information to such as our stream cleaning crews um, and stream maintenance crews that we have and emergency services um, you know using a device like this and, and using a forecasting type model, we can actually depict when we feel like a, a certain road will flood. And, and uh, emergency crews can actually bring that up and, and see, okay, this road's gonna close in an hour, or you know, the depth of water and the velocity over this road is gonna be impassable. We really need to lock these down. And they can be tools for the public as well to keep them safe and out of harm's way. There's also, um, other things that, and, and some of these honestly certainly would have some um, uh, legal ramifications that would have to be discussed and, and, and quantified, um, but maybe showing building and structural information. If a building had a clone or a LOMA certificate done, um, you could actually depict that in this platform. You could see its uh, highest adjacent grade, lowest adjacent grade elevations, um, if it had a survey elevation, if it, if it had been flooded in the past. Um, and you can do that interactively in the environment and, and see the information associated with those structures. And also utility locations. I mean, that's just another simple example. Where are the stormwater systems? Where 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 is that critical infrastructure um, those can be utilized in the field using augmented reality so here's just an example of an application that we did um, this is the wichita kansas riverfront area um, very near the keeper of the plains and the exploration place um, for this test, we started with the two augmented reality methods, or a, a, a few augmented reality methods. First, just using the standard device GPS. Um, we then upgraded the device, um, and then also attached a Bluetooth receiver. Um, for this, we used the Xiaomi uh, Mi 10, um, which has enhanced GPS capabilities. Um, we use the Bad Elf Surveyor uh, Bluetooth device to try to get uh, more to like a one meter resolution. And then we also use the EOS AeroGold RTK system. Uh, it's a really set up well for surveying um, down to one centimeter accuracy. And then finally, just using a, a, a manual positioning uh, method where the user sets the XY they set the orientation and they set their height. Um, and the rest of it is derived from the DM and the information around them. So this is just a video of, of, of that application uh, from the map. Um, and you can see the water level, the exploration place there in the background. And you can actually move around in this environment. You can walk downhill and the water gets deeper. You can move back uphill and it gets shallower. And you can see how that water level compares to uh, the surrounding environment. In this case, there's actually a rock wall uh, there in the background where the flood level, you can see where the flood level gets to and, and also a light pole right there that you can see where the water level gets to. It's a very immersive experience, and I, I feel bad because I had hoped that this would have been done personally, um, but and, and you all could have experienced this in, in our test environment, um, but I hope that this conveys how immersive this, this type of application really is and, and, and really how powerful it is to communicate flood risk um, to, to the public. Um, I really think that this is a, a, a growing and emerging field that has a lot of potential in the flood risk and flood risk management services. So some pros and cons of augmented reality. Um, you know, it's a real, it's an immersive and, and it's a real world environment. You, you're standing in it um, and, and being a part of it. You're, and if, uh, 
pre-COVID-19 and hopefully post-COVID-19, you can experience it with others. Um, and I think that, that that really provides a personal connection to flood risk that everybody can embrace. Um, you really, there's a wide variety of applications and really our imagination is all, is the only thing that can hold us back on this. It's very innovative. And, and I think even for my grandfather who, who's, you know, 80 years old, uh, farm, farm kid himself, even he is starting to get into the smartphone realm. Well, this, this is just an application built on a smartphone. It's, it's much easier for them to utilize as opposed to wearing some sort of headset device or, or, or whatnot. There are some limitations, and there's a reason why this hasn't hit the mainstream hard in what we do, and, and the big one is GPS technology. Um, some of the hardware can be expensive, and certainly you wouldn't want to stand next to that river when it's flooding or if it's downpouring in the middle of a thunderstorm, which is where VR really can come into play. So we, we need to overcome some issues. Um, the traditional GPS tracking is the, by far the biggest one. Your GPS systems and your most commercial uh, devices are only about 30 meter accuracy. As you can imagine, if the device thinks you're standing 30 feet or 30 meters from where you're actually standing, your experience is lost. Um, so as, as uh, you know, enhanced GPS capabilities become more prevalent in our consumer products, then this, be, this uh, application becomes even more user friend, friendly and, and certainly the direction uh, of communicating flood risk. For the uh, Exami Mi 10, um, it really didn't show any improvement, but I think part of that is because I think that there's some additional GPS post processing and API integration that could be done. Um, the Bad Elf certainly improved the XY positioning, but its Z value, where it positioned yourself in the Z, really still needed adjustments. And I think that that's, that's not all that surprising. Um, the EOS Arrow Gold improved at both X, Y, and Z, but it's less user-friendly. You have to carry that device around. Um, and who wants to do that? Who wants to purchase a you know, 9,000, 8,000, whatever uh, cost device in order to use AR? So I, I think that it has merit in certain applications, but I think it also has limitations. AR is an effective flood risk tool. It's, it's immersive, informative, scalable, and, and just generally overall fun. Um, I went out with uh, a few clients during the pilot testing phase of this, and, and it really brought flood risk personal to the user. And I think that as this market continues to grow, I think that it will become a, an effective communication tool to the public um, and, and to really bring flood risk um, to uh, personal and make it personal for them. Um, but it's not for everybody. It's not for every area. There is a, a learning curve to this. And, and, that, and I think we have to overcome that. I think that there's another application of this that would be best suited given the GPS technology limitations we have in our uh, consumer products. And that's just the observation point method. So setting up placards like this um, that the user can just scan with their phone and it automatically positions them in an XYZ fashion and they can experience the environment around them using the same device, the same tool sets, but they don't have to manually adjust anything. And I think that that is gonna have a lot of uh, application potential. I know that it's been done in other parts of the country as well. Um, and I really think that until our GPS technology um, continues to enhance, and it will undoubtedly enhance, and it's already getting better today, um, I think that this is a, a probably the safest and most user-friendly avenue right now. Uh, for augmented reality applications. So. so with that, I guess I would like to thank everybody for their time. And please, uh, if you have any questions, comments, I'd be happy to answer those. Thanks, John. That was a great presentation. I have a couple of questions that have come in through chat. The first one is on slide 10, you have some VR environment examples. And the question mm -hmm. is, how easy are these for non-technology experts to create any off-the-shelf programs you'd recommend? Uh, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of uh, programs and software out there today. 
um, that could help with this. To be honest, uh, I utilize the experience of our web development crew. Um, I know that they use a combination of Blender and some other applications to develop that. Um, the one thing I will say is once you've developed an environment and or just downloaded uh, an environment from online, it's very easy to manipulate and, and edit those environments um, and add plugins to them. Um, you know, some examples, there, there's a lot of websites out there that you can literally buy a three-dimensional environment directly offline for, you know, dollars um, to start from and then start tweaking in a web development application from that point. Great, thank you. Um, for AR, what software or tech are you using um, in order to have the images display geospatially in the correct place and orientation through the viewer? Yeah, another great question. Um, so first of all, uh, we started with multiple just hardware devices as, as I talked about in the presentation. Um, I was just using a simple iPhone success for the hardware aspect of that. For the data in the background, we actually were just utilizing simple rasters uh, that is a risk map product uh, directly from the FEMA mapping process. And then um, I'm trying to remember the exact application, but um, it would, a lot of AR tools are automatically built into Unity. And, and so you can utilize Unity and they have a lot of the algorithms already built in for mobile phone devices um, that you don't have to customize uh, from that. Um, I will say that there was a lot of manipulation that had to be made um, to orient yourself correctly um, using just the standard GPS, as I mentioned before, those GPS environments are not um, very accurate at all in our, in our current hardware devices. Certainly getting better, but they have a long way to, ways to go, so. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you have advice on how to nuance the difference between scientific versus illustrative details in AR and VR rendering? Um, one challenge they're mentioning is when users refute water surface elevations because buildings are white prisms instead of true color. Yeah, it's another another great uh, uh, remark. Um, you know, we have overcome some of that by placing uh, high water marks on those surfaces. So if you're utilizing a, a virtual or a, a synthetic building, for an exa for example, you can place a high water mark uh, on that uh, building face so that it gives the user a perspective of how high the water truly is based off of the scientific data. Um, that, that would certainly be one way to overcome it in virtual reality. In the augmented reality, it's actually a, a, a similar type issue in that when you don't enforce those buildings or those obstructions into the image, it can be lost through perception. And so one challenge or a minor challenge that we faced is whenever you have people walking around in the background, depending on how close or how far away they are, the perspective of depth can change. And so we overcome that by putting common obstacles with common heights into them so that it gives the user, uh, when you're looking at it through the camera, it gives them some perception of depth, so. Great, well, thank you. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions today, but I wanna thank you and all of the other presenters for your efforts and IBM for sponsoring this session. Thank you. Thanks.